Hi, I'm um, Gary MD, Head and Chief of General Rheumatology, and we're here at the BSR Annual Meeting 2019 with 2,100 of delegates. Uh, with me is Professor Choi, who's one of the co-editors, perhaps one of the co-editors of the journal, and who has also written a fairly highly uh, interesting and exciting paper. Uh, Eris, please tell us about it and tell us about the background. Yes, I want to write about the JAK inhibitors, mm -hmm. particularly the relevance of selectivity yeah. in terms of its clinical impact. Uh, partly because we have drug inhibitors approved for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and we have many uh, being developed and they're all said to have different selectivity. So I guess one of the key questions clinicians may want to ask is does the selectivity make any difference mm -hmm. amongst these inhibitors? Now it's important to say that uh, the JAK inhibitors are involved in the signaling pathway of many cytokines. But there's one fundamental difference between JAK inhibition and what we're used to, which are biologic treatment. In biologic treatment, we are trying to block a particular cytokine to a large extent, almost neutralize the effect. Yeah. With uh, JAK inhibitors, we only want to turn down the activity of the cytokine without completely blocking it. Because in animal models, we know that if we do block the JAK kinase completely, it leads to severe immunodeficiency, and that is That's undesirable. Yeah. And so, do you think that any uh, of the four, what do you think is going to be of relevance? Is it JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, you know, JAK okay. or does it take two? So, one thing we know is that JAK1 is definitely a good target mm -hmm. for rheumatoid arthritis. And in fact, all our current JAK inhibitors inhibit JAK1. Okay. And it's important to, to realize that um, the JAK kinase system work in pairs. Yes. So actually if, and they often signal with different pairing, but in fact if you inhibit one, it will inhibit the pathway significantly. You don't need to inhibit both pairs in order to inhibit a certain cytokine. Okay. So with inhibiting JAK1, we will have inhibited interleukin-6 family of cytokines, the common gamma chain cytokines like IL-2, IL-15, it will have inhibited uh, gamma interferon, will inhibit both interferon alpha and beta. Okay. So that is, that, is the, that is the implication about JAK inhibition for JAK1. Now JAK2 is slightly different from others in the sense that it is the only isoform which signal as a homodimer in certain for certain cytokines, and these included all the what we call hemopoietic cytokines, the erythropoietin, the thrombopoietin, the GMCSF. Um, now we know very little about complete JAK2 blockade because when we knock out JAK2 in animals, these animals all die in utero because of defective hemopoiesis. So we, we don't understand the biology of JAK2 really as well as the other isoforms. Okay. And looking at the horizon, we've got a tick 2 inhibitor coming through the system. So what do you think is going to be happening there? Well, I think we will have to um, look into the clinical trials to confirm this, but at least for inhibition of, say, JAK3 or TAC2, it would have some effect on interleukin-6 signaling because we know that the interleukin-6 family of cytokine signal through JAK1, uh, JAK2 and TAC2. So it's likely that it will have some anti-inflammatory effect. Whether it will be the same, we don't know. Uh, but in terms of clinical effect, uh, one thing is really uh, apparent in the clinical observation is that when you have an inhibitor of JAK2, you see different uh, effect on the laboratory value. So uh, hemoglobin tend to remain stable in JAK2 inhibitors, whilst with JAK1 inhibitors, what we see is an increase in hemoglobin level, as we would expect uh, if we neutralize inflammation effectively. Okay. Well, that's going to be an interesting one. We look forward to listening to the paper. Thank you very much, Ernest. Thank you. Thank you.